the podcast series Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafta, and today I'll be chatting with Julian Flossback, CEO and co-founder of Be Free. Be Free focuses on consumers' financial health by building a tech-enabled ethical credit management company that makes collection processes in Africa more scalable, efficient, and user-friendly. Julian, how are you doing? Hey, Stacey. Great. Thanks a lot for having me. Really appreciate it. Of course. It. I'm excited to have you on. How's the last couple of weeks been? I, it's, it's hectic as always, but uh, how yeah. we say in Nigeria, we move. So, so it's going well. <laughs> we move, yes. What's been happening? Update me. So we, I think one of the main things is we expanded to Kenya um, with our product and awesome. services over the last uh, three months, which was, was quite big. Um, and the market is picking up very well, so which is really for us a great validation of our business model, um, not just in Nigeria, but also in Kenya. Um, so that got us bumped. Um, then also, yeah, you might there, there might be some other news coming out soon, but, but more on that in the, in the future. I'll keep an eye out. I have so many questions, but before we dive right in, I want to learn more about your career journey and ultimately what led you to Bold Be Free. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. Um, so let's let's maybe just for, for a second first talk about what Be Free does. Um, so I think yes. that, that helps a little bit. So Be Free in the end is the first uh, digital first uh, a credit collection company in Nigeria or credit collection fintech. And um, in the end, we automate uh, credit collection processes for, for lending uh, companies, for financial institutions, for microfinance banks and so on. Uh, because if you really look at, you know, the lending value chain in, in Africa, you know, everybody has always been focusing on better data, has been focusing on digital lending. And, but nobody has really ever focused on this horrible customer experience uh, when customers, you know, can, uh, you know, uh, repay their loans. Um, yeah. And that was always something that really bothered us um, and that we are, that we're now fixing, I would say quite, quite successfully. Uh, we started in, in August um, at 2020 uh, in, in Nigeria uh, with, with some first clients and now manage uh, over, over half a million customers uh, for around wow. about 20 different, different lenders um now in two countries uh, as mentioned um so it's it's been picking up picking up very well um but how how do we get there so actually i'm i'm german so i'm i'm as german as you as you as you can be um, but i always <laughs> said if i had, had a connection to you to can't Nigeria, get more german than me i love yeah, that yeah, yeah 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 it's like we're getting ready for Oktoberfest, which unfortunately has been cancelled but in lagos there's a small one so looking very forward to that i um, went a couple of years ago loved it loved it yeah it's it's it's, it's great it's great it's a really really good fun um but at least uh, growing up German, I, I still had a connection to, to Nigeria uh, because my 10-year-old brother is actually living in Lagos for around about 12 years. Um, so, so Lagos and Nigeria always played, you know, like in our family, quite a big role. Um, not so much in the beginning of, of my career. Um, I, I went to business school in, in, in Germany. Um, then I started working in investment banking, um, uh, classical uh, mergers and acquisitions, and with also parts of, of like, like some consulting uh, stinges. Um, mm -hmm. But always had this connection to Nigeria, right? And I think I, I regularly flew to Nigeria, let it be for weddings, let it be actually just for pleasure. I think I was one of the mm -hmm. few people who actually would, would fly to Nigeria for tourism uh, simply because I really enjoyed the vibe and uh, very much the country. I really lo love Nigerians. Uh, they're really amazing people. Um, but I uh, never really had ambitions to come here. Um, that changed, I think, like three or four years into banking. Um, when I, I was getting tired of suits and I was in Lagos for a wedding. Um, and by really by coincidence, met the founders of Fair Money. Uh, so Fair Money at the time, um, was, uh, well, had just raised their, their seat round and they were looking for a country manager. Um, and that was, was somehow a really good fit with them. Um, and I think two weeks later, I quit my job in Germany. I was on a plane to, to Lagos to take over the position as, as country Spontaneous. manager. Yeah. Yeah. I was really fed up. I think in banking, you either stay three years and, or, or you go crazy and stay, stay your life. Uh, I didn't yeah. want to stay my life. So, so, so I got out. Um, and, and plus I, I really like, like, Nigeria, right? So I think it's it's mm -hmm. one of the most most flourishing places in the world. If you just look at it from from a funnel logic, um, if you look at the places right now with the with probably the highest uh, opportunities in the world, you look at Africa, 
Um, then if you, if you look at uh, Africa, one of the countries with the highest opportunities, probably Nigeria. And then if you look inside of Nigeria, the city with probably the highest uh, opportunities is Lagos. And so mm -hmm. just out of fun and logic, I think, I think uh, Nigeria right now in Lagos is one of the greatest places to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so at least uh, I joined, joined Fair Money back in the day. Um, and that was really, we were pretty small. I think we were like eight, eight people, uh, giving, you know, like, uh, like a couple of hundred loans per day. Uh, so basically everything quite, quite small. And then, uh, basically over the next one and a half years, we scaled Fair Money very, very aggressively in Nigeria. Um, over, over 1 million customers at the time, uh, giving, uh, uh, many, many thousand loans per day. Um, and in the end, you know, scaling through series A and then up to, up to close to the series B, uh, that they raised with, with Tiger Global. Um, and a, a big part of my job was always credit collection, right? As a lender, we would give out loans. Um, but we would also have to think about how do we get our money back? Um, and every financial institution or, or like every digital lender, at least, uh, that I know at some point has built like in-house credit collection capacities, mainly through a call center. Um, so in, in the beginning, you just hire, you know, like 10, 10, 20 guys that sit there and call yeah. your customers and ask them to repay. Um, that works quite well when you're smart and when you're smart. But when you suddenly have a million customers and you suddenly, you there's know, just no way. Yeah. It's like, you really got to ask yourself, look, do I want to be a credit collection company or do I want to be a lender? Right. And yeah. of course, lenders then, you know, in the end, do, uh, take the strategic decision to say, look, we want to focus on, on, on lending and we look for an outsourcing solution for, for credit collection. Um, and that's, that's the same process we did. Right. So we looked at, uh, you know, basically all, all alternatives you have in the market. Uh, we looked at, you know, traditional credit collection companies, uh, that are mainly come out of a field collection aspect. Right. So they usually go and visit customers. And for us, there was always a no go, um, because we couldn't, you know, control the accountability and the transparency in the processes. So we didn't know if they go out, do they threaten our customers? Do they break their noses or do they actually help them to, to repay? Um, so there was always, always then a no go for us. And in the end, uh, we ended up with so-called BPOs or business process outsourcing companies. Um, these are in the end quite, quite large call center companies, right? So usually they work for, um, a tele, tele sales for telcos. They do customer service for banks and we could, you know, get a hundred people who would, who would, you know, in the end call our customers and ask them to, um, yeah. That's still for the customer a pretty painful experience because if you look at at how these these call centers work, it's usually you know like a one size fits all uh, call script. Yeah, they treat yeah, yeah. they treat every customer the same. Um, every every week or every couple of days, you receive a call, um, and and that's really not a nice customer experience, right? Um, but for us, to be fair, there was always always you know we were happy that we had the problem solved. Um, and that really changed last year with COVID. Um, so when basically COVID hit Lagos in uh, end, end of March uh, with the lockdown, um, or in Nigeria in general, not just Lagos to be fair, um, suddenly as a, basically all lenders had two problems. Um, the first one is they couldn't grow anymore. So the core, core product that they had was not working well because the, the risk in the market was just unpredictable. Um, and the second problem was all of, um, basically the, the, or like the, the default rates were going through the roof. Right. So, so suddenly we had a lot of, lot of portfolio at risk in the market. And now we had this company, Fair Money, with like all of its, you know, amazing uh, people, yeah. amazing talent, amazing, amazing, you know, like, like uh, technical capabilities, data science capabilities, and so on, looking at how can we improve our collections. And that was then basically suddenly, you know, like, like top of mind for everyone. Um, we did a bunch of, you know, like quite good, uh, good experiments at the time. We we're doing, really doing some, some progress. Um, and then after eight weeks, I think the lockdown ended and everything went more or less back to normal. Um, and that's when my co-founders and I said, Hey, look, we've been, we've been working a lot on this, on this problem. Uh, we've been doing a lot of, lot of progress on this. Um, let's, uh, you know, leave fair money, um, and offer this as a, as a service right, to, to, to lenders. Um, and then basically we, we gradually phased out of, out of fair money, right? So we're very, of course, transparent with them saying, Hey, look, guys, uh, we want to, want to, want to focus on a different problem, uh, still in, in your value chain. Um, and do you want to come on board as a, as a client? Um, and then they actually, Fair Money was one of our first clients. And from then, basically, it just went, 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 uh, uphill quite, quite quickly. Um, and that's, that's how we got to, to where we are right now. 
Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh, created a new hypothetical game. Now that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what do you make? Something original and exciting? A Dark Souls city builder, a co-op roguelike, everything, all of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a and put it in a first-person shooter, and we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls, and maybe you could, oh, I don't know, save a kingdom from some out-of-control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favourite podcast platforms. Awesome, awesome. I have so many questions, but I'm going to take it all the way back and start with when you first moved to Nigeria. You came in as a country manager. I have covered the idea of what a great country manager is quite a bit on the podcast. And what a lot of hiring managers have said is they look for somebody with a great network. And I'm just assuming that this was your first time working in Nigeria. What did your network look like? And what do you think set you apart from from the rest? Yeah, yeah. I think that's 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 a specialty because I, I came in as an expat manager, right? Uh, which was in the end um, um, basically driven because we needed somebody who can communicate between our our Paris based head office um, as well as in okay. the, the the Nigerian uh, uh, team. Um, and I, and I think there was actually quite a lot of lot of cultural. Um, um, uh, I would say there, there's, it's simply pa- like like French people were very different than than Nigerians, right? At least to, mm-hmm. to, to a large degree with regards to communication and so on. And what really has had helped me was that I had spent a lot of time in Nigeria before. Um, and often, you know, like, like a couple of, I think before I moved to Nigeria, I was probably here, uh, close to, close to eight, nine months, um, through, through, you know, like, like family and so on. So, so I, wow, I knew wow, what okay. I was getting, getting myself into. And I, and then, you know, most of my friends were, were, were Nigerians, right? Um, so when I, when I basically, Met actually the fair money founders. I was just at a wedding um, where I was laying on the ground in front of the parents of my friend's uh, wife uh, to to convince him to to marry marry. Him. <laughs> um, so, so I, I done laying on the ground. I'm like, where's the sentence the, going? Where, welcome to Nigerian weddings. <laughs> and so so that helped me a lot. And then of course also with regards to 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 network. Um, that was for us actually not so super important because we were not a B2B business, right? We were a B2C business, um, which was much more about methodology of processes. Um, uh, so if, you, if, if, I, if I would have gone, you know, like into, for example, the position that I am right now, where we are a B2B business, and I for sure would have not been the right candidate. Um, but basically, when we looked at the methodology, how you uh, build marketing campaigns, how you, uh, you know, uh, grow processes and so on. And that was in the end what I was what I was doing. So it was much more an internal role than an external role. Gotcha. You've made some impressive leaps in your career. I was having a scroll on your LinkedIn before we chatted. And I was really curious to know what you felt prepared you to take this challenge of building your own business. And what advice do you have for those maybe more early in their career wanting to do the same? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a brilliant question. Um, I, would, I would break it down into, into two parts. Um, I think the first one is industry experience and the second one would be a general startup experience. Um, when you look at, at industry experience, that was probably for us the, the main driver, right? We were really in a sitting in, I would say, a key position in the industry where we really had a problem that annoyed us all the time. Right. So we, we, we already at Fair Money basically tested, uh, how can we solve this problem? Right. Mm-hmm. And then just didn't get the capacity. So that helped us a lot to, to, you know, go very quickly to market with a, with a product that solved the problem. Right. And I think we, we didn't have to, 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 in the end, test around for a very long time uh, what the product needs to look like because we were previously the customers of these products. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So that, that really helped us a lot. And, um, then the the second part is probably general startup methodology, and I think that's what what a lot of people um and also that come out of out of fresh out of university or, or come from you know, like a different role um in startups in, in the end building a successful and improving a, a product, especially after you have uh you know kind of 
found your disruptive niche in the market is is actually purely method like to very very large yeah. methodology right so it's it's always looks very glorious in, in TechCrunch or in TechCabin <laughs> yeah, uh, but, yeah. it's, it's, but it's actually just impl- like to very strong uh, uh, degree implementation how do I build you know now now product management processes how do I move from a Kanban yeah. product management style to to a Scrum pro- product management style yeah. and how do I uh, you know uh, do a fundraising process right that really helped me a lot that I was I was working in banking before uh, as an investment banker um so 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 that really helped and if i now would recommend like two things to somebody who would who would start a startup is number one don't start a startup in a space that you don't know so you, okay. you have to have an understanding of of the market i think there's there's very f- like very few people that have actually been successful and who read about those but there have been much 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 more people who have not been successful doing that mm-hmm. um and the second part is I would always recommend to first join a startup and learn the methodology, just like the same way you go to university or you get a degree. Yeah. Uh, probably here, the the startup experience is probably even more 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 important. And I think there's there's a couple of roads which you know like pre the were like really good to to do that. I think we see a lot of successful founders uh, coming out of product roles, right? Um, who were previously you know head of product uh, yeah. and so on. Um, because they, in the end, are constantly uh, confronted with basically problems within the value chain uh, and looking how to solve them. And I think that that really helps. So if I, w- if I could start my career again, I would definitely be a product manager. I would have not uh, done this, this MBA route. Got you, got you, got you. BeFree has been around for just over a year and you've been so, so successful where most businesses only start seeing this after three years. What do you think is the reason you are where you guys are today? Um, yeah, very, very, very good, good question. I would also name a couple of points here and that goes hand in hand with what I said before. I think like having a very strong understanding of the, of the market and the problem, which allowed us to find a product market fit very quickly, right? So our product market fit was more or less, we knew which, which product we had to build. We just had to make it more scalable to, to scale it. And that took about like, like three, four months. And then basically we immediately started scaling the product. Um, so that, that really helped us a lot. Um, then the second one is to, to simply have killer co-founders, right? So with Chooks and Moses that I, that, that, are, that are sitting in the boat with me, um, I, I probably have some of the best killer ex, uh, executors that I've ever met. So we are really, really good at, um, not talking for a long time, but basically doing stuff and testing it. Um, yeah. and not, you know, like over planning stuff. So we do a lot of mistakes if you look at, you know, like how, how we work. Um, we, we constantly have you know, like a high tension internally where we, where we, I would say fight for the better solution. Um, but one thing we don't do is, is being slow. Right. And, and there was also, uh, what I experienced with Chooks and most, most before, because they were basically both with me at Fair Money, um, where, where I really saw that, you know, how well they can execute. Um, so that's, that's, I would say probably the point why we are where we are right now. Um, were you surprised be- by how successful you guys were? How quickly as well? Uh, yes. Yeah, I thought I thought it would be um uh yeah, no to be very fair, we it, it's the demand that we see is is very very high. Um and for example, we don't have a sales team. Um it's it's basically purely demand based uh right now um, and we basically have to see how can we manage manage that demand so we're a lot more basically busy scaling scaling our infrastructure and so on um and when you when you look at um are we surprised by the speed of how things are going i would yeah. say yes we we were but we knew that there was a big problem Right. So, and it, and yeah. we, we right now see that the problem is significantly actually bigger than we had <laughs> anticipated, I think. Yeah. I think that a massive takeaway isn't only that you had knowledge on the industry, but there was this massive demand. And it's actually a podcast episode I recorded earlier today talking about the importance of demand over supply. And we're so focused in the fintech industry on building like the best tech, the coolest tech, where we forget, is this something that's needed? Is this already in the market where I feel like you guys were coming in um, and working in a space, first of all, that you mentioned, you understood, but there was this high demand, which made the product so successful. 
Yeah, I think when you look at look at products here that really scale, um, I, I always cluster them basically into two categories. Uh, are you talking about a painkiller or are you talking about a vitamin? Um, in the end, a, a vitamin is a, is a product that you know is nice to have, but not a must have mm-hmm. in the product. When you look at a painkiller, that's something that you need, right? Um, you, yeah. It's like a, like a real pain point in the market, and that you're solving this pain point. And those are those are commonly companies that you know scale scale quite well. Yeah. You mentioned earlier just expanding into Kenya, which is so exciting. What did that process look like? Where are you at right now? Yeah. Um, so in, in the end, we uh, with Be Free, we're seeing in the end the, the, the problem that we're solving, not just as a as a Nigerian or Kenyan or African problem, but it's in the end a global uh, global emerging market problem. Right. So in the end, every market that is quite large uh, has a credit deepening and has a challenging legal infrastructure for collections is potentially interesting for us. Um, and that's really also our, our, our strategy going forward. Um, so we're looking to scale into, you know, several markets. The next market that we're looking at uh, are more in, in, in Southeast Asia uh, or, or Latin America. Um, and for this, in the end, we need to write a blueprint. Right. Of how, yeah. how do you expand into a market to have a clean methodology here to, to roll out and replicate your product? Um, that's, uh, why we went to, to Kenya, Kenya so early, right? In the end, right now, we, we're looking what are actually the processes when we enter a new country? What are the challenges, uh, for us? And, um, then in the end, develop this blueprint. When we now specifically look at the challenges that we are facing in Kenya, it's much more that we don't yet have this reputation that we have in, in Nigeria. Um, in the sense of, uh, I would say we now have a quite good top of mind presence with most financial institutions in, in, um, in Nigeria. And we didn't have that in, in Kenya. So a lot of times when we would speak to customers, uh, they would actually say, okay, great. We can speak, but in, in six months again, after you have settled and you have proven your system, um, this, yeah. not, this is now basically at the point where we are, where we are, you know, like, Closing the first, what we, in the end, proof of concepts with clients, uh, where clients test us, and the clients are happy. They're scaling up their portfolios, and um, so we have we have more or less built that out. And um, that's that's uh, that's quite well. And um, then a, a second challenge, I would say, is especially around regulatory as well and labor laws, um, which are much tighter in Kenya than they are, for example, in in Nigeria. Um, then I would say another one. Is uh, goes in a similar direction is in the end, for example, salary basis and so on. I think here we didn't do our homework incredibly well uh, be, before we entered Kenya, um, but overall it's it's been going it's quite quite well and uh, actually a little bit better than than also expected. So we expect us to be to be slower. And it's, it's going quite well. Yeah, is your debt collecting style copy and paste in each market or are you altering it according to the culture, the way people mm. respond? Because I'm just thinking of Southeast Asia. I, I spent quite a bit of my my early mm. earlier years in, in Indonesia and I can just imagine the style you'd ask people, listen, you need to repay your loans versus yeah, in Africa or just let's just take South Africa. It would be completely different in the way people would respond. And um, I could just imagine that being a different style. How have you gone about that? Yeah, it's 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 correct. We got we have to customize a lot, um, but in the end, we deploy a ground like like I call the base technology. Uh, so like uh, like basically in the end, some base processes um, that allow us with quite little customization to to enter a market and test the market. Right, so we can immediately test our hypothesis, our commercial uh, assumptions, mm-hmm. and so on, um, and that makes it makes it quite, I would say, cost efficient for us. Yeah. Um, but going forward, of course, there's basically a lot of uh, customization that we need to do. So we 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 basically right now hiring product managers in in, in Kenya to customize our product to the Kenyan market, um, mm. and and that's of course something. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the, the 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 language in Kenya is different, right? Everything is in Swahili. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's not not a, not a pigeon like in, in in Nigeria, and the payment infrastructure is different. And of course, you need to consider that when building building a, a product. But here, you need to have in the end killer product managers that are really on the ground and do you know like user interviews, uh, uh, test the the application with users and so on. And I think we we're doing that quite well. Fair enough. That's brilliant. I've seen the word ethical all over your website. And it's clear that this is something really important to be free. What are your thoughts mm. on the lending space having this bad rep in Africa? Yeah, I am um, I'm actually a little bit concerned about the bad reputation of lending. 
um, okay. because the this reputation that lending has is driven by a few players who um, in the end misuse the system, right? So these yeah. are, these are um, in the end loan sharks, uh, a cup, loan sharks correctly. Uh, they're often uh, uh, Asia-based uh, 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 lending companies um, that in the end uh, don't stick to the rules, right? Lending lending is a, is a brilliant product that helps, you know, like millions of customers um, if it's applied correctly. And if now, now companies, I mean, there was just, uh, for example, in Nigeria, a fine, uh, for, for Sokolo, um, from the NITDA, which is in the end, the data protection agency. Um, and we very much, very welcome that, right? We also welcome, for example, regulations such, uh, as happening in Kenya right now with the digital lending bill, right? Where, where lenders have to be regulated. Um, but it's important here to not throw all lenders in basically uh, one 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 hole, uh, but to really differentiate and look at the lenders. Uh, the yeah. problem with predatory lending is that they systematically, in the end, ex- exploit uh, customers, and then you know through very aggressive collection techniques, uh, in the end, um, um, are, are incredibly hostile and damaging to to the financial well being of customers. And then on the other hand, you have, you know, lenders like, uh, I'm just going to name a few, like Tala Branch, Fair Money, Carbon, uh, that have an ethical lending approach, right? Yeah. Um, and those products are great, right? People need credit. People need credit. Yeah. Um, I think that's something I've been noticing quite a bit in the industry is the marketing. And that's what's troubling for me, at least, is I'll see a poster mm-hmm. saying no interest. And you're like, what? Like, how is this possible? How is there no interest? And then as somebody who's educated on the space, I'll go read the fine print. And that's kind of what the issue I'm having is it's not just about regulation. It's also about people not being educated on the space and what do certain words mean? Um, I think mm-hmm. that's going to be a problem. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, if you look at consumer lending in, in Africa, it's essentially in Nigeria, five years old in, in Kenya, eight years, right? And mm-hmm. um, so, so I always give the example of the U.S., right? In the U.S., and um, what basically happens is the moment you are born, the first thing your mother does is she hands you a credit card and tells you about your people <laughs> or your credit card, yeah. right? And um, that's not the same in, 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 in Africa. Right, or yeah. in Nigeria or Kenya. You don't have this generational transmission of financial literacy. Um, but that's actually a- exactly one of the angles where we come, uh, basically that we tackle from, from, from with be free, right? We, we don't just look at the symptoms of, of default, but we much more look at the cause root of default. Um, mm-hmm. so when we, for example, see that customers don't repay because they say, look, I don't want to repay, right? Uh, 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 some, some, some lenders might now say, oh, this customer is a fraudster. And, but actually yeah. in our data that we see the majority of cases, these customers don't repay because they don't prioritize the, the loan repayment over other expenses. Um, and that's in the end, um, basically, uh, a consequence out of not knowing the importance of having to repay your loan, right? And it's, it's in the end a consequence of not knowing why there's a, why, why credit score is important. So we very strongly focus in the end on these customers on increasing their financial literacy. Just to give an example, it's not not fully launched yet, but we are right now building building a new uh, 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 in the end financial ad tech uh, solution into our self service platform. So let's say you you haven't repaid your loan, you can you can go on our our self service platform and then you can take financial literacy classes, uh, take a quiz, and if you pass them, you get discount on your on your final loan repayments. Um, because wow. in the end, we, 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 uh, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I think it's a funny comparison. Um, I, I, or like, like as somebody said, uh, we are like, um, uh, undertakers, right? They put people in the grave. <laughs> um, but only in the sense that if we do our job wrong, we see our customer again, right? Yeah. Um, so, so we really don't want to see our customers twice. We're probably one of the only companies that has no interest in seeing the customer again. And for us, in in the end, it's the best thing if the customer, uh, you know, goes through our process and then comes out as a as a financial uh, person or like financial literate person that yeah. that does not fall into this the situation again. Um, Love it. But but of course, we we also here need to need to address that that we need to target on this financial literacy earlier, right? And I think that's that's also that I quite quite often discuss with, with lenders. Is to say, look, what we are doing now, basically as an as an after, I would call it after sales to to the lending product. You guys can also do that in the preparation. And I think here we need to think much more communally. How can we increase in a commercially viable model uh, financial literacy of customers? Because also lender yeah. has has an interest that the customer repays on time, right? And I think that's 
that's that's the that's the, the fundamental part. A lender does not want their their client to to default. Yeah, yeah. Julian, thank you so so much for being on the podcast. I loved having you on. I loved having this conversation. Cool, awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey. Really appreciate it. Uh, for, for having me. Of course, where's the best place for all listeners to reach you? Yeah, it's probably on LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably the best way. Uh, it's Julian Flossbach, um, Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N, and then Flossbach, F-L-O-S-B-A-C-H. Awesome. Thanks again, Julian. Cool. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, Connecting the Global Fintech Community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new, exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.